Good. Thank you very much for coming. Nice to see that there. It's on. Ah, so going there. So um, happy to see that Commodore 64 is still a topic or still raises some interest. It definitely does for me. Um, few words about me um, in daily work. I'm a Linux kernel hacker, specialized on embedded systems and um, doing lots of low-level stuff. And I still prefer limited machines. If people come to me and saying, hey, have you heard about this new ARM um, quad-core with super-duper GPU graphics powers? Uh, that's not what amazes me. That's a little, yeah, well. Um, but with limited machines getting something done, that's, that's what raises my interest. And this is because I grew up like this. Uh, I'm hacking the Commodore 64 since 1988. I just realized it's 23 years. 23 is always a nice number. And um, I've been mainly interested in the, the demo scene, which was back then very, very hype and uh, laid the foundations from the to the demo scene we know today, even if it's PC or whatever. And yeah, it, it is a passion. I don't know if Zen is the right word, so I put a question mark behind it, but uh, searching enlightenment via excessive practice is not an understatement. I, I really did this a lot, and I learned a lot, and oops, um, it, it is part of my history, so uh, it, it made me who I am today. And uh, I'm not so active like I used to be, but I have still a lot of interest and I have still a lot of ideas left. Um, what I'm going to show, the demo, is of course not my personal work. That was, would be too much. It is a group effort. I mainly work... Uh, with some close friends of mine, also located in Germany, and a group of people which are in hung Hungary. And I really have to thank them because it's, it's always a great collaboration. I think we collaborate now for m more than seven years, and it's always great fun working together. And I really have to thank them a lot. Also, I want to mention that I want to, this talk to be seen as a case study. This is. One example, I think an interesting example, but uh, it doesn't mean that this demo is the best C64 demo of all times. I think it's a good one, though. Uh, we're not the absolute gods of C64 coding, and uh, there are other people re doing great stuff at the moment. This is one case study, and it's not even uh, meant to be a glorification of the C64, although it is a very cool machine. <laughs> Um, but there are other platforms, and I'm usually easily bored by platform wars. So if you have another 8-bit machine uh, sh and have a great demo, I'm, I'm be the first one to appreciate that. Um, I also understand if people are, get bored by C64 demos, because I get bored with PC demos. So, so that's kind of uh, fair then, I guess. Some short facts about the Commodore 64. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about it. I think Michael has uh, last, doing the last times, great overviews of the Commodore 64 just for those, or to fresh up. Uh, we have a 652 based CPU, which has less than one megahertz, three registers, 556 opcodes, although we use some extra ones. I'll be talking about that. Few addressing modes, we have no multiplication on assembly level, of course, no sine, cosine, so it's more like adding, shifting, stuff like that. 64 kilobytes of RAM, people are always amazed how less that is. I still think it's quite a lot. Um, forget about the ROM. Um, yeah, you, you, first thing you usually do is switch it off to get all the RAM. Um, the machine has various graphics mode. The one which is in, used in this demo is mostly 
by 200 by 16 with the limitations you see there. But we have movable object called sprites. We can, uh, C64 is very famous for it. We can place it and we will use it. Yeah, sound, the famous SID. This is quite a mighty synthesizer, I think, because of the modulation and filter options. We have to load in data, so we have to take care of the disk drive. 170 kilobytes per side, so can, yes, you can turn the disk. Remember that part, turn disks. Sadly, it's connected by a serial interface which requires even handshaking, so it's very, very slow, especially if you use the, what is supplied from the beginning. And one other gimmick which is used in demos usually are the internal timers which can be chained to each other. They are a bit underestimated, but they are quite powerful, and I like them a lot. Um, the design choices about this specific demo, um, it's a bit special in that case that we had the music in the beginning. Usually you have a concept, and then you have a musician who follows, tries to follow the concept with some music. But this time it was around, there was a music already present, and we had a few effects were already done, and Oswald, who's really, really, really good at designing demos, had the idea this tune has so much potential for a demo and came up with a script. And given by this music, we wanted high pace, really effect, 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 not showing too long. Um, yeah, what's, what's the, the last point here is really meant right in your face. Here you have it. Um, some, with other demos you notice, okay, there's some filling material either to build up some tension or because they have loaded new data or for whatever reasons. And we wanted to avoid this or empty screens as much as possible, which was quite a lot of work. The next demo we did, we decided on a slow pace and that was so relaxed to do, but it's missing the kick, <laughs> I think. So... With that bit of talk, I want to show the demo now, so everybody has seen it at least once. Uh, you see the current work state, because when we released it, it was a 90% version, then we put out 91%, what you now see is like maybe 93, although it's five years ago. <laughs> but actually, we, we tried to finish it for this talk, but uh, we couldn't make it. Although we have some internally makes some good steps um, to finish it really somewhere. No promises though. So let's see. Let's hope everything works now. It's an emulator though. Forgive me about that, but the C64 has such a strange pulse signal, it usually confuses beamers, and if you want to go safe, you use emulators. So please turn me down and the volume up.
Yeah, thank you very much. Glad you liked it. Um, so, before we talk some further, I need to define some terminology which happened to, which is established in the C64 community. These names are there for ages, although they're sometimes weird. Um, I will probably talk uh, or mention the term speed code a lot, um, which is basically unrolled loops. Uh, maybe you have heard that before. Um, you just skip loops because iterating over loops costs some extra cycles and you want to save that. Um, I took here some very primitive, uh, simple example. Uh, load a value from a sign table indexed with an index register, add another value of that table with another register, and store that as a pixel to whatever graphics mode you just have. And instead of doing this in a loop, you just put the offset here again, sign table, sign table, and then the pixel again. Do this 1,000 times and you have a simple plasma. Um, okay, you can do a bit more nifty things to, to make the plasma look better, but it's as simple as that, and that is why I generally don't like the, these plasma wavy thingies because they are just too boring, I think. Speed code, unrolled loops. Um, sometimes I might mention illegal opcodes. Uh, those are in fact just undocumented opcodes. Back in the days that sounded perhaps not cool enough, so they were illegal. Um, this is just from the fact that not all uh, opcodes were yeah, wired to some useful or planned features, so they had some open and didn't bother to knob that out. So they do strange things and uh, people have learned to understand those strange things and make use of it. So we have actually more opcodes than those that were documented. And uh, if you really go for the ultimate thing, you should use those which are useful. And in fact, I, I own one world record which is only possible because of uh, these illegal opcodes. You, there's no way you could have done that without them, but that's too much detail, just believe me. Uh, sometimes I might talk or slip through the term raster time, just interpret this as cycles. It's, it's based on that because you know the raster is building up the screen and if you take, t it takes some time, if you take some time or burn some cycles, the raster moves. So sometimes it's called raster time. Um, to, to get a glimpse on what, what happens, things we do, I called it, um, self-modifying code is a central way of doing demos. I don't think there's any decent demo without self-modifying code, and it doesn't matter if you modify the arguments of an opcode or the opcode itself, it's all the same. Code is data, data is code, you do it as what you want sometimes tables are mixed patterns of code and data and whatnot, so we make extensive use of that. Uh, one other example is we abuse a stack. What you here see in the first line is uh, I, w I want to get a lot, lot of information from a table, so I could just get the first ta um, value here indexed, increase the index, so that will cost me six cycles. If I just get a value from the, from the stack, pull accumulator, I get it from the stack, it just costs four cycles and the stack counter will automatically move, so I can just do the next pull and I will get the same value for four cycles without taking care uh, of incrementing something and it leaves the, uh, we just have three registers, it leaves one free. So there are routines which completely use the stack as a table of whatever. The problem is when you have interrupts, the processor will use the stack to store data on it. So you have to copy that somewhere else and later um, put it back. And in the end, this is some kind of sliding window technique. Um, so the, you have the stack as you want it. Tell that to your computer science professor. He will be very happy about that. <laughs> he would also like this one. Okay. Um, on the C64, it's pretty important sometimes that you do really certain things at a certain time. One cycle off and it won't work. So, um, 
you first you have to eliminate some jitter so you know when exactly uh, you get something stable so you know when you are where and this is usually done by timers using timers and let's now just assume the dc06 um, i like talking in hex values I, I would never do this uh, when doing kernel code but when i do 64 i just i would never give that a define that's dc06 that's a timer and let's assume if you read that timer you know how much jitter you have hmm? and one thing you could do you read the timer feed that value into a de delay loop and once you run through the delay loop you have your set you have everything stable you know where we are there's one thing i don't like about this approach there's a delay loop i mean we have just uh, 20000 cycles per frame and i hate delaying very much and uh, there's one way to get rid of it um, dc04 is another timer which you can imagine is rightly in front of that one and we write some values to it you could now think okay it's counting for c what's that that's 76 okay it's probably counting 76 cycles for whatever reason but later we see this this is setting up the interrupt vector low byte 04 high byte dc hey we've seen that that's dc 04 it's directly jumping into the io register space it's accessing code uh, here in the first timer register and now i can tell you 4c is the opcode for jump i don't care about 76 the timer is not running it's constant memory so this is the opcode for jump this is the low byte of the opcode so it's zero it could be anything wherever i place the routines now what is the high byte of the opcode it's dc06 that's the timer who gives us the jitter so it changes with every cycle uh, it changes the, the jump instruction changes and when we uh, jump to it at uh, exactly defined uh, times uh, we will jump to a very very specific jitter routine so we can optimize it for that special occasion that would tell will terribly fragment memory but it's really fast <laughs> and uh, this is used in one for use doing one graphics mode where we you have 100 extra interrupts per frame and it wouldn't be possible without such techniques i love such things <laughs> okay um there are so to say two sets of effects on the commodore 64. um i call them the first one table based effect and those have lots of tables and lots of speed code and the magic is in the tables and the speed code generators if you look at the speed code itself you probably will not figure out anything because it's just shuffling data around and you see no pattern um, these are more mathematically based effects for example if you saw the tunnel there or stuff like that and um, yeah those are for people who, who like 3d effects or whatever mathematically based uh, they're easy in that part that if they're too slow well they just look slow and you can uh, try to make them faster you can use some chunky modes to get them farther they look, then you have resolutions like 80 by 50 or whatever if you use dithering you can hide that and most people also call them new school effects where new school means like 1995 and ongoing <laughs> remember the commodore next year the commodore 64 will turn out 30. this is quite a lot and those effects are usually really you know that in frames per second 50 would be good that would be the maximum or one frame 25 it depends on the effect you can do that but some people do 10 uh, that's not very enjoyable for the end for the audience i think but some people are very brave in that regard the other type of effects are vic this is the graphics chip or register based effects um they might use speed code not so much and 
pretty simple tables and the magic is the actual code. So if you look at the code, you, you see a lot of registers written and if you know the registers, you can really get the idea of what is going on there. They m mostly run in inform context to make this stable thing more easy. Must be cycle exact like I mentioned. And this is different from the others. If your code is too slow, the effect is impossible because uh, um, you need to set up a certain amount of registers in a certain time and if you fail to do that, you won't create the uh, program the chips as you want and you will just get a black screen or whatever. So this is what uh, the old school effect we're famous for, cycle counting. Uh, okay, I have to do this at that time and I have to do that at that time. Okay, I could do this. Oh, no, 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 I need to do that as well, but it won't fit. And then you start doing some magic and if you're good, it fits. It's a totally different uh, style of effects. And the nice thing about the combination I, from the Hungarian guys and me, or our group, is uh, we can do both. And uh, we can combine that. We're not the only ones who can do that, um, but um, that, said, that has a lot of potential. Um, if you s maybe remember, that at the beginning there was a bump mapper, it looks like a, a torch was shining onto something. The bump mapper itself is a new school effect. It needs a lot of tables, not lots of speed code but it moves. And the moving is an old school effect because the main, all the CPU time is done to do the actual bump mapping. We need a fast way to scroll. And then you can use old school effects because then you can start poking in registers and confuse the poor Vic chip so much that it gets totally confused and shifts the, the picture around. <laughs> And uh, this combination uh, uh, between new and old school, uh, there's lots of potential still left, I think. Um, I don't want to spend too much time with this one, just to give you an idea what's used. It, these days it's mainly really only cross-development. Uh, I started in 1996 with cross-development. Back then I was laughed at. And, killing the true feeling and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's status quo today, especially when it comes to coding. Uh, but you should always pay attention to test everything you do on the real machine, especially if you do graphics, if you do sound. Um, otherwise, you might have strange surprises. With code, it's a bit easier. Yeah. Of course, we're using the internet, they being in Hungary, or one is in England, and um, me being here. Interesting thing is that the whole demo was compiled using my old Pentium laptop running DOS, but it was working fine since 96, and I never had a reason to change. <laughs> and I think it still did a pretty good job. But other than that, uh, every developer has a freedom to use what he wants. In the so there's Visual Basic, Java, and whatnot involved. Um, that's the basic memory layout I tried to impose on the other people because I could impose because I was responsible for the linking. So I could say I, I'm aiming for that. And the lowest things are given by the hardware architecture. The zero page is special because you can access this memory very fast. This is the stack. And then I decided, okay, we need a loader to get data from the disk. It needs some buffers and we have a dpacker, which is relocatable so I can move it around if I want. Some temporary stuff. The music, which needs to be in a memory present all the time and this is here you can do what you want with the parts and now let's take the uh, recursive mapper which is also in the beginning as an example so far so good it uses the zero page a bit of a stack for variables here are some temporary tables and here's the init code table speed codes it's new school effect so it has lots of speed code we are lucky, we have 500 bytes left, that can be quite a lot. 
Um, so you think it's all fine, but then, oh no, there's this special table which, without which the effect can't work. Sadly, that is terribly fragmented, but I'm tempted to show you why it won't work. Okay, I, 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 yeah, I'll be brave, and you be too. Uh, the nice thing with the way I do it is that I can not only compile the demo as a whole, but also parts separately, which makes um, testing a lot easier. No, no, music off is okay, we don't need that. Okay, this is the part. And now go to the monitor. Can you read that? Can you read that in the back? Yeah? Good. Okay, that's just show some code. Speed code. It shuffles memory around, uh, um, gets it from some table, puts it somewhere. This is in direction, so it's more or less a pointer. Some 99 blah, I don't know. So try to make a pattern out of that. Let's look at the pointers. Oh, okay, that was not good. Ooh. Yeah, the font is too large, but if I make it smaller, you won't see much. Okay. Will you believe me? It points to roughly the same memory. <laughs> um. And if we go to that memory, we see another speed code, which shuffles a ra ra uh, memory around again. This is, in fact, the screen memory. So here the screen gets updated. And you see here, um, it gets, an, again, uh, values from some tables. And the tables, always the high byte and the low byte, are always in the range 0 to 0f. Zero and this is one of the key tricks of that effect, because it's recursive. It's important that the index to the table can be used as an immediate value or as an address here. So this value can be just, again, it's a speed code with lots of self-modification. We modify the speed code, so we need that. We have to directly put this value here, or let's say here and here, or we need it uh, in the register to work with it further. Scary, huh? <laughs> and um, all I wanted to... No, I don't want to close. Okay, well, if you're happy that way. Uh, this is what I wanted to mention, why those tables have to be exactly there. And uh, you can't move them, so you have to work around it. So. The, the key thing to remember is you can make great plans, but uh, demo part coders will always come across and think of something else. You have to deal with it. There's no way around it. So there is a table destroying my loader code, so I have to back it up somewhere before. So I have to do a lot of relocation, and this is really, really ugly, dirty work, but there's no way around it. Talking about loading, I don't want to meet the Commodore engineers who designed that. Or actually, they had good plans for that, and it was mainly the management who spoiled that because they wanted some awkward backwards compatibility so they, the engineers couldn't use all the hardware features which could have made loading fast. It is really awfully slow. And you cannot use the uh, routines Commodore delivered at all. So demos have their own way to improve the situation. And one way to do this is, well, usually you have a clock and a data line. So you have one bit transfer. And uh, we use the clock line as a data line too. So we have a two bit transfer. Uh, that means we have to use the attention line, which is just for basic signaling, more or less like clock or handshaking line, which is a bit dirty but works reasonably well. The drawback is that you can have only one drive attached to your Commodore 64. If you have two drives attached, they will be totally confused, but with one drive, it works fine. But you have to design it all 
or for yourself, you need custom code in the drive because Commodore drives are intelligent. They have their own CPU, they have their own memory. And so you write code for that too, to make a proper loading system. There are advanced demos who use the uh, drive as a coprocessor. So while the Commodore 64 is uh, cleaning the bitmap or whatever, doing some drawing, the floppy drive is actually rotating some points and thus the rotated points are sent back or stuff like that. Um, back in the days it was very cool to do everything on your own so people did their own loaders, but as you can imagine it's pretty hard. Um, so a lot of them crashed and did not work reliably. As a result, we have just a few these days and these are, these are commonly, commonly used. One of them is our Dreamload, which has special feature. You can run it from a hard disk, which is available, or even from the MMC sub uh, cartridge. That used to be a feature which was cool, but it got a bit outdated. People have other hardware and you don't really need to have to support the hard disk anymore. Um, so that's a bit of a pity because we could put some, quite some effort into it. But you have, uh, as a result, you have to take care of loading all yourself to design the protocol, get it stable. And keep in mind that your drive is not the only drive in the world. It it's involves mechanics. So if you tune your loader for your drive, it, it will perfectly crash onto the next one because the mechanic is a bit worse and it can't come up with what you programmed. A rule of thumb, you want good compression to minimize loading. If you can avoid loading, do so. So what can you do to do packing, crunching, compressing, whatever, how you name it? Um, there are millions of compressors out there. Everyone has his favorite and people like to do their own. Um, most are LZ-based. LZ I used the best packer around, uh, which is called Exomizer, which is really good. And it's astounding how long you can, a, a gigahertz or two gigahertz PC can uh, take to pack 40 kilobytes. It's not like minutes or hours, but a few seconds. And it was really designed with, to achieve the best packing results, which is nice in many ways, but the um, drawback is that sometimes the depacking is too slow, so we pimped it a little bit with some parameters and that worked out pretty well. Oh, and we rewrote the, I rewrote the depacker so it's larger, of course, there has to be a trade-off, but it's faster. But uh, if, you, if you want to have a decent packing system, I don't think you will you can take something off the shelf. You have to invest a bit of uh, time to that one as well. But that worked quite good. The other rule of thumb is you know your data best. Do some a priori, use your a priori knowledge. Uh, you know the symmetries of your tables. You know where delta packing might be sufficient. And try to not rely on a generic compression algorithm. If you know something which could be helpful, use that. This is a lot of work, but if you want to save loading and want to keep a high pace, do that. And then we needed to put it all together, because you can imagine if you work on a demo on a part, you worked only on that part, you want to get it going, and once it's done, if it does roughly what you want, you consider yourself done. And then you want to throw seven or eight of them together. That won't work that way. You have to, yeah, well, I won't read it all. This is really, really the dirt work. <laughs> Everybody I know hates it. Uh, it's pro usually not regarded in the scene. It's God given, and still it's the number one reason why demos fail, come not ex into existence, stop at 64 or 90% versions, um, doing this right, removing all the glitches, doing some transitions. But there's no way around it. You have to go through it to, f uh, to, to 
to get the proper flow. And here's where also where you have the trickiest part to keep all in 64 kilobytes of memory. I have this part running, I want the next part loading, How, where can I do it? Oh, I can shut off maybe half of the part sometimes and then load that already. And uh, This is tricky and totally different from demo to demo. I don't think you can use a generic framework on that, not with C64 demo effects. As I sh tried to show you with the memory, re memory layout I, before, this is too special. There will be always one special case where all your framework won't work, so it's mostly handwork. There's only, in, in this demo, there's three global things more to say. It's load, load from disk, depack, and call the music. And everything else uh, has to be handled individually. And even after being done at 90%, I don't see more to, to, to generalize. Synchronization, um, it's usually a good idea to do that with music. People like that, and me included. <laughs> uh, if things are timed to music, if music switches and you have an effect, something switches on the screen as well. Um, because music is played once per frame, once, for, uh, once the raster beam runs through, you just use a simple counter, that there's no magic. Um, you have to keep in mind with syncing that loading drives, drives are mechanics, so loading times can be different from the system you use yourself, so always use some tolerance. Most coders have a, a really, really bad floppy drive, they call it, I don't know, killer drive or bad drive or whatever, the worst drive they could find and they test their demos on them and once it passes on that bad drive you can consider yourself done. And yeah, well, another nice thing music players do use instruments internally, do, I don't know, do a bit of pulls, do a bit of noise and you have a drum, something like this. And they have numbers and you can peek into the music player, find out which uh, memory location contains the instrument number and okay, then you find out if instrument 6 is a drum and sh then you can check in your code, is a currently a drum used then, I don't know, light up the effect or change the color scheme or whatever. Um, this is also often a, a nice way to spice up your demo. Okay, now I'd like to, to show the demo again with some minor comments. I think we can leave the music off, so because I, I will be interrupting anyway. Um, just to point out some more specials. Now I gladly killed my terminal. Let's see if I get the tip. So. Um, one thing, you, I don't know if you know, heard that before, here this is uh, the so-called border and this is a visible area. Um, I mention this because soon there will, will be an old school effect which is crossing the borders. It's, it used to be a main effect back in the days, but these days you can uh, just add it somewhere to give a bit of Oh, that was nice feeling. Oh, that was. Oh, they took care. It, nice detail. Here, yeah, we went through the border with the graph. It's nothing breathtaking anymore, but it's some extra effort, which is nice to put once in a while. Okay, here as I mentioned, the main effect is a new school effect, but we are able now to do some, to add an old school effect to get this moving, and I don't think this has been copied so far. Mm, I 
let's get away. One thing I'd like to mention here is that we also um, decided to entertain the audience a bit with additional graphics here on the left side. That used to be, I had to change my way of thinking because I was always wanted to put all the energy into uh, the effect itself, but Oswald rightfully convinced me that we need to put some elements onto it because displaying this graphics because it um, takes uh, 10 to 12 percent of CPU time. Uh, we need to new use sprites for that, and those need to be multiplexed. So here are three or four, four. We just have eight sprites. So, um, so usually they would be ending here. So we have to reuse them, which requires additional code, displaying sprites, not all that. But I think he's right. 10% uh, might not be too noticeable. and It gives a little extra feeling to the demo part. This one is uh, special because um, this is, it's what we call a loader part. It's, um, I think, 20% of the time is used to load the next part into memory. Actually, it was just meant, well, we need something to do, or oh, let's do a plasma. I said they're pretty easy, but Oswald tried hard to make a, a high resolution one, and he succeeded in that. We made a very good move with moving the girl into the middle, because you have a full screen like impression, right? Although just one third of, roughly one third of the screen are used, calculated by the plasma. Um, and so what was intended to be a loader part is now the, uh, I think if everyone, most people on the net, if they want to be, pick, put up a screenshot of our demo, they use that, although it's just only, it started to be a loader part, pretty, pretty amazing. But the th sad thing is we know how fast it actually could run if you don't have the loading in the background. And so that makes us a little bit sad. Luckily you, you don't know. So you can enjoy it as you, as, as you see it here. The rubber cube. Yeah, originally you think cubes are easy, you just draw lines, but now the lines try to shape, hey, that needs to be a lot of mathematics involved. Uh, <laughs> The key thing here is uh, you, dr you draw the cube into buffers, so you have a set of buffers, and uh, pick from older buffers. Uh, the, what you actually display is a mix of current and older buffers. So I, don't, I wouldn't call that cheating, but I don't know if some people on, on PC would do, but it uh, gives a very good rubber cube. Yeah. Well, the Hungarian guys are really good at math. <laughs> and uh, although this is, this is Oswald's part, and he's very good at this speed code table thingy, and I know there are some lookup tables involved using shadow, and I, I rewrote the part because his speed code generator was taking like, I don't know, three and a half seconds, and that was too long, so I optimized the generator. I'm quite sure he wouldn't recognize it anymore. So it just took one and a half seconds, but what the part actually does, I still haven't figured out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a seven color twister. This is, uh, so to say, an old school effect because on every line here, I set up a amount of, of registers to display the, li the line itself. And I do this 192 times, and then I'm done which is pretty nice because it leaves all the upper and lower border again for loading. And while this part is displayed, we load the next two parts and keep them in memory for later. Um, it's also technically not quite interesting because I don't think any internal counter of the graphics chip is the way as it was intended. So it's totally confused. There's just one problem with the part, have you noticed? It's, 
It's fucking ugly. <laughs> we ran out of time to do to to add a proper object. Meanwhile, thanks Joe, I have a proper object, uh, which is this is generated from some I don't know. Um, and now we got a hand drawn object, and the movement is very very bad. I mean, it looks like stretching, not really like twisting. It should be a twister. But the final version will definitely improve on that because this was one of the main blockers for the final version. That's, that is what we call coder colors, you know? <laughs> Every graphician would run, run away crying with seeing that colors, but well, I'm a coder for a reason. The graphics are all hand pixeled, by the way. Uh, I think they had a photograph as a reference, but it was not not wired, as we say. It was really hand pixeled, and I think they, given the constraints, they did a re really, really good job. Yeah, and this I don't know. <laughs> it's a free directional tunnel. Uh, the final version will be able. You will be able to control it with your joystick, to see it real time. The creator, Bubis, has a PhD in math. <laughs> I think you need that. No idea. I, I fell off my chair when I saw this for the first time. I think about it, we have still 985 kilohertz. And we do a free rotating tunnel there. Um, well, beats me. Also, this is, this is a filler. We have to get rid of that in the final version. That's just too boring. I don't like the graphics too much either. Yeah, and then we have the tunnel. We have to admit that uh, the calculation of the movement is all pre-calculated, pre but the, the, filling and the, yeah, the filling is done in real time. And this is another part of which will be greatly improved in the final version. Yeah, that was that. Oh, uh, one thing I changed, it now reloads itself, so once you started it, you either stop it or will run endlessly. <laughs> yeah. I think this was it from my side. Um, I hope you could find something interesting in that for you. I hope uh, it wasn't boring or could give you an idea. And of course, if you have still questions, I'm eager to hear them. We have 10 minutes for questions. So if there are any questions, please raise your hand so that an audio angel can come to you. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, where were you in the 80s? We needed you. <laughs> now, actually, why wasn't this possible in the 80s? I, I mean, I've seen a lot of Commodore 64 and nothing goes, I, I mean, just the last scene was a bit like the game way out, but everything else was just totally amazing and beyond what was being done in the 80s. So what makes the difference? Evolution. Uh, I can't probably say more than that because, of course, with those new school effects, they were, they were influenced by PC demos sometimes. They had more computing power, so they could try three directional tunnels. And once they had, once they had this done, C64 coders tried, okay, let's try that on our machine. So this, this would be one, uh, one answer to that. And um, it takes time. To, to really understand the machine. This is, I, I, this is what troubles me in real life, you know? I work, I work on, on Lin for Linux for new CPUs and once we have the basic set of drivers and everything in the main line, the processor is discontinued and you start working on the next one. That's somehow stupid. <laughs> and 
a lot of things which are abused here are more or less flaws in the chips, but it takes time to find out that there are flaws, and then it takes time to find out what you can do with these flaws. And uh, we're still... It, it got rare, but there are still once in a while somebody comes and shows something on the Commodore 64 which has not seen before, after 30 years. It takes time. Any more questions? Uh, yes. Um, maybe I uh, want to connect to this question. Uh, is it possible that emulators uh, got an impact on developing demos on the 64 because of um, easing the development cycles? Is it possible? Um, I would extend this to cross-development in general. Uh, my first system I had was uh, a cross-development system where the assembler editors and everything was on, on, the, on the PC. And I transferred the object code to the C64 via cables. That was already a, a big help. Um, using emulators is another help because you can stop the machine at any point in time without any side effects. There are very good freezer cartridges, so you can stop the, mach the real machine, but they tend to have side effects. So it makes it a bit easier, yes. Okay, I have another question. Um, I really understand uh, that you have to use self-modifying code to, to show uh, such demos. Is it possible to reuse code, or do you uh, write every demo from scratch? Can self-modifying code be reused? Yeah, because you can reuse the generator. Uh, um, every code, ha code has, even the self-modified code, has an initial state. And you can re reuse that. But reusing in this term, at least from my point of view, it means uh, if you want to use something from older demos, it's copy-paste and hack on it until it fits to the current demo. I, I don't have any kind of library or so, but that tends to not work for my case. I won't, I w I'm not sure about all the others, but I, th I would think it's rare. Okay, thank you. There's one question uh, on the ISC. Yeah, there are actually two. Um, Finkel is asking what your favorite C64 demo is. <laughs> Um, that changes over time. Uh, at the moment, I like very much uh, Andropolis from Boost Design, the, which has uh, a very astonishing 3D part, which is real, real time. Um, and I like Insomnia from 60 Forever pretty much. And there was one Fairlight demo, I just forgot. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and Delroth or Delroth is asking, did you find or fix any bug in the emulator while working on this demo? Uh, I didn't fix any bugs, but uh, emulators had to be fixed for that demo. Yeah. That happened. Because I'm, I'm the, the guy who really likes to do the register-based effects and try out new things. Uh, I think there are quite, no, quite some, but a few improvements resulting from my work, yeah. That's always fun, gives you a good feeling. <laughs> okay, one more question. Uh, I have two questions. <laughs> um, you have a macro assembler on C64. Uh, don't you use uh, macros for speed coding, for example? Um, the problem, yeah, you can do that, but the problem is that the speed code, it has a pattern, but for example, the addresses you use change very much. So a generic packer will have lots of problems with that co speed code. So uh, that results in, in large binary blobs you have to load. As I said, you have a priori knowledge. Um, you know how the pattern is, and using these generators, you... Uh, you save a lot of code. It's really like the, these generators are, 
I don't know, 500 byte, one kilobyte or whatever, and the packet code could be 12 kilobytes or 20. So you usually don't do that. Okay. And uh, on Commodore, uh, you can have a scene manager because I am from the PC scene and we use uh, scene managers, but I don't think that, I don't know actually if uh, Commodore have enough power for that. For what? Uh, scene managers. No, um, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, yeah. So how do you manage the scenes? Uh, it's like a... Yeah, uh, we have a script uh, so written down more or less and uh, then we work on that according to, the, according to that script, sync to the music and then it's more or less done manually. Oh, well, okay. There's one more question in the back. Uh, so how does the demo team organize itself? Do you use uh, version control or do you use IRC and how do you communicate and does everyone work on its, on its own part and in the end someone has to like put it together or is it, uh, yeah, is there cooperation involved? It uh, depends a bit. Uh, usually we use a lot of email and IRC. Um, so far we did not use a version control system but do it for our next demo we will start using one. Um, <laughs> it's a bit of, Oswald is really a great, a, a great coder. He lacks a bit in, term on, uh, in terms of software development methods. So for, was it this demo or the next one? We, intro we introduced him to the magic of make files. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry Oswald, but <laughs> that was necessary. <laughs> so we will next introduce version control systems to him. Um, what else? As it, you know, working on the parts, sometimes you have an idea and work on that individually and then in the end show it to people and then they have comments or not. But sometimes uh, you already have a script and then you have an empty spot there and then you collect ideas together and one starts and others add to it. So that depends a bit on the situation. It can be that really one coder is responsible for a part, but it can also be a team effort. Okay. Or, so or like with the, the bump mapper, Oswald comes to me and says, okay, I want to do this, and I will do the bump mapper, and I, I need a routine from you which does the scrolling. And then we define some interface, and we throw it together. And which version control system are you intending to use? Once again? <laughs> Which version control system are you intending to use in the future? Um, subversion, because... What? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to explain Git to someone who just learned make files? Uh, but, but is, <laughs> uh, but he's got a PhD, right? So... <laughs> No, 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 that's it. The PhD was the other one. No, oh, okay, um, I think it's, see, we have uh, Windows, Mac, Linux systems, and I think it's okay to use subversion as the least common denominator. I will use Git as for N for sure, and I'm happy with it. They, they will be happy. I don't want to force something on people. I just want to work with them as they want and as they're used to, and most people in that regard are used to subversion. Okay, thanks. Okay, there's one last question here in the audience. <laughs> Hi, um, I'd like to ask another question which is connected to the previous one. Um, how do you organize in the sense, um, not what tools do you use, but how do you interoperate um, personally? Do you explain stuff to each other? Do you educate each other or is it more like um, splitting tasks and work individually and, and put it all together um, afterwards? Um, no, we're, we're teaching and we're explaining stuff uh, to the degree the other person wants. So 
I am more the specialist for, for these register-based effects and uh, the, uh, the other guys are more specialists for the table-based effects, but that does not mean that we don't know shit about the other part. So we do know something and we do want to improve our knowledge, so we really we discuss uh, to a certain degree. Uh, I did not want to know all the mathematics behind the free direction <laughs> tunnel. I'm <laughs> just happy that it's possible to do on the 64. And uh, but to a certain degree, yeah, we yeah we work as a team and explain stuff to each other. Uh, we also discuss ideas. Do you think this is possible? What would it need, and how could it be done? Do some brainstorming together, also. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, but we are running out of time. So thank you, Ninja, for this wonderful talk. <laughs> <laughs>